and we're live. Uh, good evening, good friends and supporters. Uh, welcome back to night two of Fuse on the Hill. Um, if you saw one, part one, you saw they set the place on fire. But as you know, every round goes higher and higher. We issue cha challenges and we want to have action. And we got some mayors on the line and that's our attraction. See, we want some people who truly care. So we're blessed to have four mayors and one vice mayor. All of us proud of the purple and gold. These brothers have been serving for decades, tall and bold. So as I told you before, don't just relax and chill. This is the return of cues on the hill. And as we have this session called Mayor to Mayor, everybody bow your heads for a moment of prayer. Most gracious and heavenly Father, we come to you giving you thanks. Thanks for this day. Thanks for these brothers assembled. Thanks for our guests. Uh, we thank you for the Omega Psi Phi Fraternity Incorporated. We thank you for our senses of Christian manhood and scholarship attainment. Now we pray you bless every brother that's going to speak, every thought that's, that's uttered, every word that's said, every concept. We pray you bless those who are in travel and transit. And we pray that you put peace in our communities, God. We pray that we come up with solutions and we pray you touch and cover these mayors because we know it was not easy to get there. We love you and honor you in Jesus name. Thank God and amen. 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 And now it is my distinguished honor to present the first vice grand bosses of the Omega Psi Phi Fraternity Incorporated. Brother Ricky Lewis, he will do our welcome. Yeah, thank you, Brother Drake. I appreciate you. Certainly want to say good evening to everyone. I bring you greetings from the blue state of California and my home here in Los Angeles. I was born and raised in Pensacola, Florida. So it's good to come back home to the Sunshine State. Uh, Brother State, my respects to you. Brother Drake, my respects to you. I'm just honored to be here amongst all these outstanding giants, these honorable mayors. Uh, we're here for day number two. I was in last night for day number one, all the way from Los Angeles, and I really enjoyed it. On behalf of our grand boss, Dr. David Marion out of Jackson, Mississippi, uh, we want to say welcome, sit back and relax. We thank all the brothers for their sacrifice and their service to our outstanding organization. Uh, let's have a great time tonight and enjoy ourselves and, and learn a lot. Brother Drake, let me yield back to you. Thank you. And thank you, Brother First Vice Grand Bosses, for all the work you continue to do, the sweat equity, and the uh, consistent support that you do from state to state, not even district to district, state to state. Uh, moving forward, uh, I have the honor of introducing our moderator for the evening. This man needs no introduction. Uh, he's been serving Omega since 1985, crossing on the campus of Morgan State University at Pie Chapter. His name is Dr. Michael D. Boo. He has been the advisor at the University of Florida for Omicron Zeta Chapter for several decades. Yes, he looks youthful in nature, brilliant man. He currently serves at the State of Florida Director of Public Relations and at the international level as an international undergraduate advisor chairman. I pass the mic to the moderator, Dr. Michael V. Booley. Thank you very much, uh, Brother Drake. I, I didn't know you had all those skills that you used at the beginning. I, th I know we all heard them and we were very appreciative of you. But brothers, let me just let you know, today is number two, day number two, night number two of a three-day power pack evening of civic and economic empowerment. And let me just say that, as we talk about today, tonight, mayor to mayor, what we're gonna deal with is not just saying good evening to everyone, but saying good afternoon to those, because I know that although we know some of us are on the East Coast, we have some brothers in Florida that may be one hour behind us. And in addition to that, we also know that we got brothers that are listening in and people who are listening in from across the state and across the country. So we welcome you all to night two, mayor to mayor. And we have some dynamic mayors here to, uh, to speak to you about how you need to do what you need to do in your communities. And I think that's so important because we always talk about, you know, what's happening in Tallahassee or what might be happening in Washington, DC, or what's happening at home. And that's what we're gonna talk about today is what's happening at home and how do we get involved in what's happening at home. And I think these mayors will be able to tell you a little bit more about their plans, but in addition to that, how do we make sure that an agenda for people that look like you and me 
our, our, our follow through and how we go about that process. So I'm very, very excited. But before we move into that, I, uh, I want to see if uh, we can have some greetings right now from our Florida State Representative, Brother Tosta. Oh, thank you for that very energetic introduction to the event for the night, Brother Bowie. I just want to thank all of our panelists for joining us this evening and thank all of our um, viewers um, live. Um, as Brother Bowie said, this is night two. We're looking forward to the discussion this evening. Um, last night kicked off with a very informative and energetic discussion with regards to how we can do things and change things in our communities. And, and again, we're looking forward to hearing it from you, um, our brothers that serves as mayors throughout the state of Florida. So I look forward to the discussion. And, and if you need anything from me, um, please don't hesitate to let me know. Thank you very much, Brother State. So at this particular time, I'm going to allow Brother Timothy Sinclair, who is the boss of the Omicron Zeta chapter of Omega Psi Phi and a University of Florida philosophy major and an initiate of the fall of 2021 of Omicron Zeta chapter, introduce our panelists. Brother Sinclair. Greetings, brothers. It is my honor today to introduce these distinguished panelists we have before us. So first off, we have Mayor Michael C. Blake. The Honorable Michael C. Blake is a lifelong educator and community servant. He was elected to city council as a councilman in 1998 and served through 2001. In 2004, he was elected mayor and served two terms until 2012. In 2014, he was elected as councilman for District 1 and served until June 2016. He was recently elected as mayor in the November 2020 general election and will serve until 2024. Michael Blake has served as a member of the COCO Florida CRA, as a liaison to the COCO Housing Authority, We in Seed, and Save Our Neighborhood organizations. He has also served on various other boards, committees, and task forces for the city of COCO. He is a past president of the Space Coast League of Cities and is a current member of the Florida Municipal Insurance Trust Board and served two years on the Florida League of Cities Mayoral Board. Mayor Blake retired from teaching at Coco High School in early 2022 and has been a resident of Coco his entire life. He joined Omega Psi Phi fraternity through Xi Psi chapter at South Carolina State University in 1982 and is an active member of the Gamma Nu chapter in Brevard County. Our next panelist is Mayor Jerry L. Demings. The Honorable, Mayor L, the Honorable Mayor Jerry L. Demings is a native of Orlando, Florida. He received his Bachelor's of Science degree in Finance from Florida State University and his Master of Business Administration degree from Orlando College, now Everest University. He served as Orlando's first African-American police chief and first African-American Orange County Director of Public Safety. In 2008, he was elected the first African-American sheriff and constitutional officer in the history of Orange County and was re-elected in 2012 and 2016. In August 28, 2018, Mayor Demings was elected the first African-American mayor of Orange County and was sworn in as mayor on December 4th, 2018. He is the chief executive for over 8,000 county employees with a budget of over 4.8 billion. He joined Omega Psi Phi through Kai Tao chapter in Orlando in 1982 and remains an active member. Next panelist, please. Let's see. So our next panelist will be Mayor Terrell Hill. The Honorable Mayor Terrell L. Hill is a Palatka, Florida native and the son of Jerome Hill and Annie Ruth Miller. He attended the prestigious Howard University earning a bachelor's degree in business administration and a master of science degree in athletic administration slash sports marketing. Mr. Hill went on to earn a Juris Doctor degree from the University of Florida, Levin of College Law. In November of 1999, he opened the Terrell L. Hill PA in his hometown of Palatka. His dedication to the community is evidenced in, by involvement in various organizations serving on the board of directors and coaching high school football and baseball. He's the founder of Youth Explosion of Palatka Incorporated and was inducted into the Putnam County Black History Hall of Fame. Mayor Hill was elected to the Palatka City Council in 2014 and was duly elected as the city's mayor in 2015. 
Mayor Hill is a Florida League of Mayors immediate past president. He joined Omega Psi Phi fraternity through Alpha Chapter at Howard University in 1994 and is active with the Iota Mu Nu Chapter in Putnam County. Our next panelist is Vice Mayor Leo Longworth. The Honorable Vice Mayor Leo Longworth has an outstanding background in civil service going back 50 years. He attended South Carolina State University, earning a Bachelor of Science degree in Business Administration. Prior to college, he served as a sergeant in the U.S. Army, doing a Vietnam tour of duty before being honorably discharged. Mayor Longworth is an insurance professional of 35 years, managing and operating his own state farm insurance since 1987. He was first elected to Bartow City Commission in 1995 as a commissioner in seat five. Still serving on the commission, he has served as mayor on five different occasions and currently serves as vice mayor. Vice Mayor Longworth is a past president of the Florida League of Cities and is a seven-time winner of the League of Cities Home Rule Hero Award from 2015 to 2021. He is a board member of both Ridge Leagues of Cities Incorporated and Bartow Municipal Airport Authority Board. Leo Longworth is married to Patricia Hadley Longworth and has three sons. He joined Omega Psi Phi fraternity through Upsilon Xi chapter in Lakeland, Florida in 1978 and remains an active member. Last but not least is panelist Mayor Kenneth T. Welch. The Honorable Mayor Kenneth T. Welch is a third generation St. Petersburg resident. His father was a city council member who laid the foundation for St. Petersburg resurgence. After receiving his BA from USFSP and MBA from FAMU, Ken returned to St. Petersburg as an accountant for Florida Power Corporation. He also served as technology manager for his father's accounting firm. After years of community service, Ken Welch became the first commissioner elected to represent County Commission District 7 in St. Petersburg, only the second African-American commissioner in the history of Pinellas County, serving for 20 years. He brought a focus to the issues of economic development, transportation, equity, housing, criminal justice reform, and fighting poverty. In fall of 2021, Ken Welch was elected as the 54th mayor of St. Petersburg and was sworn in January 6th of this year. Mayor Welch lives in St. Petersburg today with his wife of 30 years, Donna, and their two daughters. He joined Omega Sci Fi fraternity through Ada Road Chapter in St. Petersburg, Florida in 2017 and remains an active member. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brother Sinclair. Um, so now we get down to it, brothers, Mayor to Mayor questions. And I, I'm ready and excited to hear from each and every last one of you. So my first question to you is, what are the top three issues you're facing in your city or county? And what I will do is I will start off with uh, uh, the county mayor, Demings. All right, let me first begin by saying uh, good evening to all of our brothers who have joined us and certainly to the mayors and other elected officials who may be on the uh, WebEx this afternoon. Uh, I'm honored to be serving at this time as the fifth elected mayor of Orange County, which is somewhat unique here in the state of Florida, uh, where you have a countywide elected mayor, a strong form of government. As such, I serve as the CEO for the county, as well as the chair of the Board of County Commission. Here within Orange County, we are a growing county. And as a growing county, we have uh, one 1.43 million permanent residents, but on an annual basis, we have some 75 plus uh, million people who come to visit our county. Orange County is now the fifth largest county in the state of Florida, but it's growing by a net of nearly 1,000 new residents each week. With that, it creates a lot of pressure, a lot of challenges. So I would say in terms of the top three challenges that we have as a county, uh, of course, Orlando is the county seat. Uh, number one is really growth management. Uh, managing this tremendous growth you know, creates many challenges for us here within this county. Number two, uh, much like the rest of the nation and the state, we have a housing affordability crisis here within our community that has been exacerbated by the pandemic that we are currently still uh, dealing with as Americans. 
And the third issue is, again, with the growing county, uh, we believe that by the end of 2022, we will have more than 1.5 million permanent residents in Orange County alone. And so that creates a lot of pressure on our transportation infrastructure here within our community. So as priorities, those are three of the top things that we're wrestling with. Now there are a myriad of other things that I could talk about and we'll get to that in a moment, but I'll stop now with those three uh, top priorities. Thank you so much, Mayor Demings. Um, at this particular time, I will ask Palaka Mayor Terrell Hill to tell us a little bit more about what's going on in Palaka. Mayor Hill. Greetings, brothers. Um, it's always a pleasure to bring you greetings from the gem city of the St. John's River, uh, the city of Palaka, which carries the distinction of having the only all African American city commission in Northeast Florida. And so we are just excited about some of the great things that are happening in our city. Um, our top three priorities include infrastructure. Uh, we've got an aging infrastructure that goes back to 1886. Our city was incorporated in 1853. Uh, when we came in office in 2014, uh, we found ourselves in a situation where we had water lines, about 65 lineal miles of water lines that had to be replaced. We were quickly becoming Flint, Michigan. Um, over the course of the last seven years, we've been able to replace uh, 23 lineal miles of water lines and really change the concepts of what we have in place overall. Uh, we've been able to uh, put the funding in place for a new wastewater treatment plan as well and move forward with some of those things. We're now on the verge of doing a, a complete restructure of streets, a total streets project, as well as infrastructure in the northwest quadrant of our city, which is the most the primarily African-American part of the community. Aside from that, it's economic development. Uh, Palatka in 2013 was named the only dying city in the state of Florida because of population deficits uh, and, and the economic disparities. And so we find ourselves uh, really the kind of the hole in the donut at this point. All the communities around us have become developed and saturated and Palatka is finally starting to realize many of the fruits of, of what the other communities have had so far. And so our community um, continues to grow. We've had a large number of developers come within the community as a whole. And so we are playing catch up to say the least uh, as it relates to providing sustainable wages, which is something that we've done through the city uh, as well as some of the other projects that are going on. And the last part is dealing with the history of, uh, of racism uh, and the Confederacy within our community as a whole and trying to create the concept of we're better together. Uh, we are one of the only communities left in the state of Florida that still has a Confederate monument in the middle of the courthouse lawn. Uh, and we continually say that Palak is like baseball. We won't really know how good it is until we let everybody play. And so we've continued to push forward. We've won awards with the Florida League of Cities for our work and race relations, having the citizenship, citizenship award as well as the Catalyst Grant with the Florida League of Mayors. And so we continue to push forward to try to create inclusive policies and opportunities so that we can change uh, minority business owners um, into contractors for the city. Wonderful. Thank you, Mayor Hill. At this particular time, we'll move to Mayor Kenneth Welch, Mayor of St. Petersburg, Florida. Brother Welch. Greetings, brothers. It's good to be with you all tonight. Uh, good to see a couple of brothers I just met a few weeks ago. Uh, similar to, to what the other mayors have talked about, uh, we're facing a couple of issues. Housing is a top issue that we're facing. If you're familiar with St. Pete, we're not the same city we were when I was growing up here as a boy. We uh, have a, a boost in folks coming to the area. We have an incredible downtown and a lot of new luxury and market rate housing coming in. And the problem is it's, it's out of the reach of most of the folks that live uh, in our city with a median income of about 23 and a half dollars an hour. Uh, and so we've got a real issue with housing. I think that uh, the Tampa Bay area, which includes St. Pete, had one of the highest rates of increase in rent for last year. Our rents went up about 25 percent last year. And so we're really focused on affordable housing and, and finding new ways to secure long term affordability, whether it's partnerships or working with groups like Habitat or just going out and purchasing land uh, through our housing land trust. We've got to you know, secure that affordable base of housing. Uh, the second is, is neighborhood uh, safety. And as you all know, all these things are linked together. Poverty is linked to housing, is linked to transportation, is linked to education. And so we're focusing on getting to the roots of neighborhood safety by really focusing on, on our young people and folks that don't have access and the digital divide and, and how that plays into it. And the last thing is uh, infrastructure and resiliency. Uh, St. Petersburg is a 
peninsula within a peninsula, and we are ground zero for sea level rise. Uh, and as we know from an equity viewpoint, uh, folks that have lower income are, are disproportionately impacted uh, by the impacts of, of sea level rise and climate change. So everything that we do, we're trying to face it from an equity lens. Uh, if you're a fan of baseball, you know that the, uh, the uh, Tampa Bay Rays uh, play at Tropicana Field, which is 86 acres that used to be a black community. Uh, it's where my grandfather's wood yard was, it where, is where our church was, Prayer Tower Church of God in Christ, and a community of about a thousand people that was displaced in order for the pursuit of baseball. And now 30 some years later, we're now looking at redeveloping in that. And one of our biggest issues is how we do that with the lens of equity to make sure that promises that were made 35 years ago come to fruition. So those are the top three uh, issues and they're all related. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, at this particular time, we'll hear from Mayor Michael Blake from Cocoa, Florida, brother, brother Blake. Thank you, brother. Greetings brothers from uh, the great city of Cocoa, affectionately known as hot chocolate. <laughs> I'm happy to say uh, a lot of similarities are like all the brothers prior to me are intertwined and we're dealing with uh, infrastructure. Our claim to fame is the great city of Cocoa. We have over 80,000 plus water customers. Uh, we range from supplying water from Kennedy Space Center to all the way to Patrick Air Force Base. Um, my greatest concern is protecting our, what we call our liquid gold, our water uh, utilities department which provide a, an economical sound base for the great city of Cocoa. Uh, my second concern is growth, uh, positive growth. I'm um, dealing with, um, we have two of the world's largest distributors in our own backyard and potentially trying to get the uh, train system here that comes from Orlando for the Demings area to, through Cocoa. And uh, we look forward in trying to secure that called Brightline. So we're talking about jobs as well. Thirdly, what's near and dear to my heart, being an educator for over 30 years and being from the great school of South Carolina State, Brother Leo, he knows what I'm talking about, the greatest chapter, Zasa in the world, but anyhow, uh, getting back to what we're talking about, um, homeless is an issue that we're dealing with drastically here and throughout Bavari County. It's universal. So my thing is making sure that people are held accountable, having skin in the game, incorporating local government with 501c3s, federal government agencies, the VA, and uh, having their family members deal with this um, issue. I'm a firm believer, if you build it, they will come. Our current population base is 20,000. So I'm looking forward as a good, safe, comfortable number from 20 to 25, maybe up to 30,000, and then uh, lock it down, but no. But I wanna say thank you very much. This is a, an event that's desperately needed and it's universal, so thank you. Thank you so much, Mayor Blake. And that, last but not least is, is, is Vice Mayor Leo Longworth, who is uh, Vice Mayor of Bartow, um, but he's served as mayor seven times. So I'm gonna say Mayor Mayor Longworth, please. Thank you, thank you, thank you Brother Blake. Uh, am I okay? Heard, am I being heard okay? Yes, okay, yes, cool. Okay. All right, so yeah. So first I am truly honored to be on a panel such as this. Uh, particularly we have the first, uh, 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 grand uh, vice on the uh, uh, the first vice uh, on the line, of course, the state. So kudos to all of you all, and thank you all for allowing us to be here. And of course, I'm in the midst of uh, I am in the midst of uh, some great men here who are doing some great service uh, with the city. But Bato is twenty thousand, about twenty thousand, and Bato was founded by. Uh, in fact, Bato is named after a Confederate general. Um, so we can't, you know, we can't. It's not, it's not like a monument where we can move it tomorrow. Uh, it's here. Uh, and so so one of the things that, well, you, and let me say our population, our Black population percentage is about 25%, 25%. And I am the only one on the, I am the only, uh, which probably is uh, uh, the same with, uh, with, uh, with some of us, with most of us, but I'm the only one on the council, the only African-American, the only Black on the council, and I have been, for most of the time that I've been on the council. So uh, it's been challenging, uh, but that's okay. You know, we, we continue to move forward. So I want to, all right, so three issues, three issues that um, that I've been focusing on, or that I am focusing on, the three issues that's facing our city. One is um, that we need to 
I'm, I'm, I'm trying to convince the commission to develop what's called a racial equity plan. And the racial equity plan helps. And the reason I'm pursuing that is because our, our workforce does not reflect uh, um, the demographics of the community. Uh, and that's something that I think is very important. You know, I think someone said, you know, said, mentioned that we have to, we have to, uh, in order to, to work together, you know, we have to be together uh, and that makes a successful city. Um, that, that racial equity plan, we're trying to do that through the National League of Cities. I don't know who, all of the elected officials probably have heard, but some of you may not have heard of the National League of Cities. So they are helping us through a program that they have. So that's something that I think is very important uh, for us to move forward. Affordable housing is another, uh, is another uh, issue that we have. Uh, people are looking for housing is, if, if, if the faster we build them, the quicker they will fill them. Uh, affordable housing is really is, is always needed and has been since I've almost been a commissioner, but it, it seems to be, be even worse uh, now uh, at a level uh, where it really, really needs uh, more attention than we can give. And the other thing is the um, preserving and preserving our historical cemetery, black cemetery. The black cemetery is in Florida, you know, the bill passed uh, not long ago, and it was spearheaded by one of the co sponsors. was. Um, uh, Representative Prentress uh, uh, Driscoll, uh, and uh, she spearheaded that. And I think that was passed the last session, the session last year. Uh, but about abandoned cemeteries, we're not, our cemetery is not abandoned, but it's probably almost gone. Uh, so I have gotten, in fact, it was not owned by the city. Now it's owned by the city. We probably did that a few years ago, and now it's being enhanced. And we have another one that's contiguous to the one that's now owned by the city that's not owned by the city. So I'm trying to bring them together. We've gotten it on the uh, historical register. So working very hard to try to make sure that we improve the image and the appearance uh, of our black cemeteries because in the past they have been neglected. Uh, and those are my three. Uh, uh, those are three issues that I uh, that we are facing in the city. Thank you, Mayor Longworth. Wonderful. So this really moves into because, as you all know, we just finished the state legislative session two weeks ago. And we just had an awesome cues on the hill virtual legislative panel yesterday. So are there any specific bills that you watch in session that will affect citizens in your area for good or bad? If you can, if you, I don't know if you know how to use the raise the hand button, but if you can raise your hand, that would be great so that I can call on you in that particular order. So um, at this particular time, let me see, because uh, I know something just hit the screen. So I see uh, Mayor Longworth, please. Yes, sir. Okay, so so let me just all right. Let me preface first what I have to say, and 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 all of the elected officials who are on on the panel know about this. This is nothing new. Um, it is called home rule, and that is so important. Home rule is so important. So what home rule is? It's allowing the local governments, including cities and counties, uh, to make decisions, local decisions locally and home rule was enacted uh it was included uh, in the constitution of florida constitution in 1973 i think it was enacted uh and of course it 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 made cities city city officials gave them the ability to make decisions without going to tallahassee before home rule we were under what was called or uh, what what was called the dillon law uh, and the dillon law is if you needed to to um to, uh, to fix the road, or if you needed to make a decision about that pertains to cities, you had to do it through the state. You had to wait until the state had session uh, and you had to get approval from the state. So home rule came in and really helped cities to make those decisions. Well, what has been happening over the last uh, probably 10, 15 years is home rule has been eroded. And what, and what the legislators in Tallahassee have been doing is they've been preempting uh, the home rule, the laws and ordinances that that cities put in place, uh, and 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 preemption is is a way of nullifying uh, an ordinance, a local ordinance, either county or state. So, so and and since between 2010, I think, and 2018, uh, the state legislators have passed more than 60 preemption laws. Uh, and that's not good. So we all, uh, those of us who are cities, we are a part of the Florida League of Cities, and the Florida League of Cities gives us a unified voice. But nevertheless, 
All right, so let me tell you what passed this session that affects cities in a good way. One was the tree protection uh, priority law. The tree protection, uh, what it did is it relaxed some of the restrictions. Cities were not able to regulate cutting down of trees in county. So this session, they relaxed some of those laws where we we'll have a little bit more uh, authority in doing that. So that was a good law. The cyber, cyber security, which obviously is really important, uh, and we hear about a lot now in the news. And not only did they pass the cyber security uh, law for cities and counties, but they also gave funding for it. Uh, and that is that is unusual. Usually, laws are passed that are that have unfunded mandates, meaning 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 the cities and counties affected have to put in their own dollars uh, to come into compliance with that law. The other is smoking in public places. I don't know whether you all knew, but smoking in public places until the, the uh, was was preempted by by cities, which which mean which meant that cities were not able to make laws pertaining to um, smoking in public places. That law, a law was passed to relax some of those preemptions. So that was good. And of course, affordable housing, you got what's called a Sadowski Trust Fund. And the Sadowski Trust Fund funds affordable housing, comes from the sale of property and homes uh, through the dock stamp. So the taxes on the dock stamp go into the Sadowski Fund. Well, it's not unusual for the legislators to raid the Sadowski Trust Fund and use those monies to balance their budget. Well, this time they funded it and they did not take as much, or in fact, they funded it with more this year uh, than last year. Some of the bad, some of the um, some of the bad bills that were passed. Um, well, let me put it like this: over 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 the number of years uh, that I've been following the session, local election law uh, was passed. Um, short-term rental, uh, combating public disorder. That's the one that's called the anti-riot bill. Um, uh, that passed, and all of those bills affect cities adversely. So we just have to just stay on track, stay on target, uh, and keep up with. So this, this kind of forum is good to have because we need to know not just us elected officials, but our constituents, we need to know so we can, so we can advocate to those legislators and tell them that what the laws that they're passing are hurting our city. Thank you so much, Mayor Longworth. Mayor Deming. All right, thank you so much. I wanted to chime in here because um, what we are seeing in terms of the assault on home rule coming out of Tallahassee is a strategy that is driven primarily uh, by the Republican Party all over the nation. What we see is that when we talk about uh, urban counties and cities, uh, they tend to be uh, run, uh, led by uh, people of color. Uh, here on this conversation and this discussion today, uh, you have uh, Mayor Welch uh, there in St. Petersburg and Pinellas County, uh, a large urban city and, and county, uh, serving as uh, the first uh, African-American elected in, in that role. Here I am in the Metro Orlando area, serving also as the first African-American uh, elected in this role. And to, uh, gentlemen, let me just say this to you. I'm, I'm very unique in that I'm one of, uh, I'm the only male on my Board of County Commission. Uh, uh, we have three Latinas, uh, uh, two white females, uh, a black female. So uh, I, I am the only male uh, but the first African-American to serve as the countywide elected mayor. We've only had a countywide elected mayor for about the last 30 years. So what we are seeing happening across America is in uh, many different areas, uh, the local governments, the largest cities in America, from New York, Chicago, Detroit, uh, Los Angeles, uh, San Francisco, uh, Houston, uh, you will see uh, African-Americans who are the mayors of the largest cities across America. So when you look at uh, the population trends, uh, if you uh, look at the state houses and the state legislator, legislatures, uh, you will see that um, the majority of governors now in, in America just happen to be Republicans. And uh, they are all about maintaining control. So there's this strategy 
uh, to, to diminish the real authority of uh, the local governments and control it at these state houses. So I believe that uh, this is a partisan strategy uh, that is going on. And, and so we do have to sometimes push back against it. As it relates to managing the public health crisis that we're still really kind of living through, I had to push back hard against the governor and essentially what the legislature did was they passed new legislation that took away and diminished the authority of local governments to make some decisions during a public health crisis. Now, when you think about that, that is uh, really flies in the face of common sense because when people have a public health, public safety crisis, crisis they dial 911. And the people who respond are those at the local level. They're uh, your uh, first responders, it is the healthcare workers in your communities that's on the front lines dealing with this. And so to diminish uh, our authority, and I spent nearly 40 years uh, in law enforcement at all levels uh, and uh, learned to be a crisis manager. So at times what I saw during this public health crisis was our governor and our legislature was slow to act. But in order to protect the public health, safety and welfare of my community, I had to be decisive. And sometimes that uh, did not play itself well uh, with the current governor. So I think uh, during this past legislative session, we continue to see this erosion of home rule. But there was one particular uh, bill that was passed on the uh, Senate Bill uh, 620, in which a county or municipality uh, could potentially be held liable if they pass local ordinances or laws uh, that a business can say harm them in some way. Now, what was exempted under this, this Senate bill is said that uh, a county or municipality is not liable for business damages caused by an ordinance that is expressly authorized by the state or federal law. So they somewhat are saying, well, we're going to uh, carve ourselves out of it. You can't sue, sue us if you're taking action because of some action that was uh, caused by the Florida legislature or by the federal government. Okay, you're exempt. But if you pass laws, if and from rent control to, uh, uh, I'm going to say, pet ordinances, banning of the sale of uh, dogs, cats, or other animals, any of those types of things that can be demonstrated to have had some type of adverse impact on a business, then the local government can be held accountable. Impact fees is another one of those uh, circumstances that in some ways there's existing preemptions. And so it is concerning to me uh, what has been happening, but until we have some balance in terms of the partisan representation in Tallahassee, I have to say that we're probably going to continue to see some of what has happened this legislation, this legislative session and those immediately prior to. Thank you so much, Mayor Demings. Mayor Welch. Well, thank you. Well, Mayor Longworth and Mayor Demings really covered uh, most of what I was gonna cover, but it really was a mixed bag. Uh, you know, the, the legislature uh, finally tried to do the right thing on the Sadowski Act funds. And, I mean, they still, if you go back, that millions of dollars have been diverted over the years. So kind of have to take that in perspective. Uh, here locally for USF, uh, St. Petersburg, there was a $75 million appropriation for marine science. That's huge for our area and, and for employment and for education. But I really agree with uh, Mayor Longworth on the issue of preemption. Um, and the impact of Senate Bill 620 that Mayor Demings talked about. We have an example in our, in our uh, city and county. Uh, you know, we had a terrible issue with red tide, uh, which really impacts our economy uh, and the health of our citizens. And so years ago, we passed a fertilizer ordinance. There are certain times of the year that you can't buy fertilizer. And, and the aim was to keep nitrogen out of the water so you wouldn't fuel uh, those kind of algae blooms. So if we were to do that today, we would have to pay the fertilizer retailers <laughs> for the amount of revenue that they lost because we passed the bill that impacted them. And you're just, you're just gutting home rule at that point and the ability for local governments to do what's best for their communities. 
And that's a trend that we've seen over the years. It continues. And so it seems like it's almost two sessions, one session where they actually concentrate on, on good work. And then another session that just seems to be aimed at the next presidential primary. I'll just say it. Um, things like the anti-woke bill, uh, where you can't teach real history um, and expanding the an election, creating an election fraud unit, when we know there's been virtually no election fraud in the state of Florida. In fact, after the election in 2020, we were bragging that we had the best election, we had paper trails and all of that. So it's almost two sessions in my mind, uh, and it's really harmful to us as local governments. The taxpayers are going to foot the bill uh, for Senate Bill 620 because they're the ones who are going to actually have to pay those real tail tailors for their lost revenue. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Welch. Mayor Blake. Yes, sir. Uh, again, I don't mean to be redundant, but I think this, this forum is very needed and valuable because knowledge is power. My greatest concern was one of the bills and all the brothers are chipping away at the important ones because they all are important was the uh, sovereign immunity bill where they were trying to cap um, for an incidence uh, ranging from $300,000 up to $400,000 and they wanted to go up from 1 million to 300, excuse me, to 3 million, where if an individual, say for an example, and it's on the Senate bill, I think um, it's from Gruters, Senator Joe Gruters, he um, was promoting this bill, the Senate bill, in reference to where individuals can sue up to a certain amount of money, and which that lawsuit would be eventually passed on to our constituents of the community. Let me give you a prime example. Say if one of my utility workers hit a car where traditionally we had a cap on it, what the Senate wanted to do was increase that cap number. So now it's becoming like a, 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 a shootout. Uh, I'm sure Brother Hill and all the attorneys here can address that too as well. But the concern is trying to protect the interests of our constituents in reference of that bill, the sovereign immunity bill and it's gonna be passed on to the consumers or constituents, the voters. And my greatest concern is trying to limit that. I think one of the tasks that they wanted to do was incorporate, depending on the size of your city, would determine the rate um, of ranging from 100,000 up to 300,000, potentially from 1 million up to 3 million. And uh, I, I'm, I'm glad that we addressed that. We pound the Capitol Hill there and our, our state representatives did address that. So that's one of my greatest concerns right now as well. Talking about the smoking bill um, in reference of cities, Mark Ryan from right here out of Bavard County was a proponent of that and they pushed it and it finally passed. So that cities now can determine who smokes on their property. And I think that's very valuable. Just like we do in the education field, you cannot smoke on a public school facility anymore. So yes, uh, those are my concerns and I'm sure there will be others. Thank you. Thank you so all so much. And I think this is extremely important for those who just joined in. This is Q's on the Hill night too, mayor to mayor. We have uh, five dynamic mayors here telling us a lot about what's going on. We just learned about a lot of information that's happening within you know, our district, but in our districts, but also things that happened in Tallahassee that impact us. Sometimes we hear about the redistricting and we hear about some of the other things that are happening, but we don't hear about these other things that have an impact on us. And we leave it to our legislative team in our particular communities to go up to Tallahassee to speak on our behalf. But we also have the right to speak to our legislators who represent our areas and communicate with them on the impact. Because if we are, if we are the ones who are gonna be responsible for paying those bills, then we need to be the ones who also speak to them and say, we don't agree with the fact that you are supporting these. And this is not a Democrat or Republican issue. This is a my paycheck issue, if you understand what I'm saying, because at the end of the day, the money is coming from all of us. And so I think that's extremely important. And so I thank you, um, brothers, for bringing that forth. Um, but as you all know, we are bringing a lot of this and this partisan issue is really coming um, forth in everything that's happening and everybody's just about winning and it's not winning for the people, it's winning for individuals and we have to make sure we address those issues. But bringing that forth, I wanna just bring us to the next question, which is how does your office assure that resources, including dollars are allocated fairly to black and brown communities? And I wanna start with uh, uh, Mayor Hill in reference to this question. Mayor Hill, 
Oh, Polak. Thanks. First, and so again, I appreciate that. Um, I think first and foremost, you've got to be accountable to the people. And that starts with getting out into the community and actually listening to stakeholders who traditionally may not necessarily have a voice as it relates to how resources are spent. And so one of the things that we've done as we start to enhance and upgrade our strategic plans, um, we've actually had neighborhood meetings where we sit down and we talk to folks who traditionally would not have conversations or be invited. And so we meet the people where they are. I think that's the first piece to the entire process. Secondly, there has to be a consciousness and you're seeing all around the country um, where government is looking at what the impacts are on minority communities. And so as we begin to pass legislation and look at some of the things that are going on, we have to look at what are the impacts. Um, as the past president of the Florida League of Mayors, one of the things that we did was we implemented candid conversations and that talked about mayor's roles in healing the community. The first thing we've got to do is address the historic harms and be honest about how government created historic harms, the gaps in educations, the gaps in wealth, the gaps in violence, the, all the gaps are created based upon redlining laws, based upon Jim Crow and based upon many things that happen. And the easy answer is to say, well, it didn't happen on my watch. The reality of it is, is that we have citizens who benefited from those gaps. And until government's conscious about those things, it doesn't change. So what we've done in Palak is we've, we've implemented the covenant for the community, which allows us to be able to look at what we're doing. And we're, we're, we're actually finalizing the plans for that, where we implement strategies that allow for 30% of all, con for all of those contracts, 30% of all workers on contracts are gonna be from the city of Palatka. And so we are implementing those things. Palatka has a, a unique situation because about 50% of our citizens are African-American. But the reality is about 10% of our contracts are being fielded by African-American contractors. And so we've actually partnered with um, Chester Wilson and Ida Wright over at, from Bethune-Cookman and we've brought them in. And so they're looking at contracting right now um, with local business owners to develop those businesses through an incubation strategy that we've used through grant work with USDA um, so that we can now take those businesses from inception um, to reality and have them um, continually coach throughout the entire process so that they can be valuable, so they can understand what PTAC is, they can understand how they can get contracts, what they need from, uh, from a funding standpoint to get organizations like BBIF involved, the Black Business Investment Fund, so that these businesses can truly understand how government works and we can teach them. The biggest part of the whole thing is, is creating access and opportunity for minority businesses to actually make money. And the way that happens is to consciously look at what flaws are in your system. If the citizens who live in your community are not the ones who are benefiting from government contract, then you have to ask yourself why. And most of the time the why is because no one's taught them how to make their service be viable to the community. And it boils down to the basics of insurance and strategies and back office support. And so if we can develop those businesses to do those things, then I think what it does long term, it allows for our business owners to, to make money in the city where they pay taxes and spend that money seven times over. And so there has to be a consciousness from the governmental side to make those things a reality. And I'm sure that this, this illustrious panel is going to have additional information to put on that. But I think that's the core of where it starts. Thank you, Mayor Hill. Let's move over to hot chocolate. We're gonna go over to uh, Mayor Blake and he from Cocoa, Florida. Yes, sir. Um, just recently at our most recent council meeting last Tuesday, um, we just incorporated CDBG funding for various local programs that directly impact our community in reference of education, um, in reference of also services provided for our military men and women also abuse situation, um, spouse abuse, um, Salvation Army. Um, we also uh, are investing in uh, entrepreneurship um, in, in a business adventure called Adventure where we provide local tax dollars, grant rights and grant funding uh, so that entrepreneurs can, uh, minorities can open up their own businesses here throughout the city of Cocoa. Um, my thing is always having skin in the game. When you have skin in the game and invested rights, uh, you want to see your community grow and also provide a way of life. Um, to me, the greatest resource we can have is in our youth. If we train them up now and provide services and resources for them. Um, we're dealing with the Wi-Fi issue here because a lot of our kids here are not accessible to a, a Wi-Fi. They do not have their home computer 
but they will have their cell phone. So they're seeking to find those hot spots to complete their assignments at home. And they, like I said, they do it over the phone. And the third thing that I, I'm really concerned about is the future. Uh, being on the space industry with the launching of all the rockets, uh, Bavard County is always in the top five in the state of Florida of earning an A or B in the state's overall grade performance for academics. Um, we will continue to invest in the youth and in educational field. I'm a strong proponent of that. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Blake. Um, uh, Mayor Longworth, you also mentioned about the racial inequities in, in uh, Bartow. So would you like to talk a little bit more about this question and um, what the city is doing in reference to providing resources or allocating resources for black and brown communities in Bartow? And if they are, then, then you know, just let us know. If they aren't, you say? If they are not offering, okay. putting the funds where they need to, then let us know. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, that, that has also been a challenge. Uh, but I'll tell you one thing that I've done uh, on the, or one thing that I've tried to do uh, in, in uh, reference to the last question that you asked is uh, about the resources, is that I try to make sure, I've tried to make sure since I've been there, make sure that the black and brown people are represented on boards and committees, city boards and committees. Uh, that sometimes is a challenge. Um, in fact, there are, some, there are some statistics out there or some things that 20% of the people don't even care about government at all. They don't care what happens. 40% don't know what happened. Uh, so the ones you have to, you, we try to work on are the 80% uh, who don't know and inform them, give them more information, educate them, uh, and of course, the other 40%, uh, they really don't have any idea. Uh, and you work on those. So the 80% are the ones that I try to work on. So when I got to, I can recall when I became a commissioner in 1995, I, um, I encountered a CRA board. And the CRA board, let me mention too, um, the CRA board is a very important board to be a part of. Because the CRA was created to enhance um, uh, black, uh, uh, you know, black communities, and so when I got there, um, uh, Brother Bowie, I um, our CRA board that was comprised of seven members, and all were white, all were white men, and so I'm kind of wondering how can we get anything done in the slum and black community, uh, and of course, slum and black community, uh, by the way can be depressed downtown areas. And that's kind of where the money was going because they met the definition of slum and blight. So anyway, I just tried, I just tried, tried to make sure to be fair, to be transparent, uh, and, and, and to make sure that, that all people were represented. I just tried to, I just tried to make sure uh, that our people, black and brown people were represented on our board and represented, represented on our committees. Uh, and so what happens is when I talk about race and equity, Probably, probably the other the other uh, brothers on the panel probably will agree that when you talk about race and equity, I don't care how large the city is, you get pushed back, it's, and especially nowadays uh, because people feel empowered. You know, the white folks, uh, and I don't mean to discredit because not all white folks are bad, but you know, white folks they they push back and they want to say that everything is okay, there is not a problem. You know. Uh, and so it takes it takes it takes a lot of um, a lot of um, um, just just pushing efforts to make sure uh, that they understand uh, that that's important. So um, so what we've done is we created uh, take for example the the CRA, which is Community Redevelopment uh, uh, Agency. The CRA we created about. I formed a focus group, so that's kind of how to get us involved or people, period, involved. Because white folks are not involved as they should either. Uh, but when it comes to our community, because we are less a percentage of the population, I have less less people to go out to attract. In fact, now we are putting together our charter review. Most cities are are are, are either embarking on or have uh, embarked embark on uh, establishing a charter review to review the charter after the after the census. Uh, that's what cities do. Cities and counties 
they uh, they review the charter, at least counted on the charter county, but they review the, uh, the charter to make sure that there are any changes. So we're putting together now, of course, there are five of us commissioned, but we're putting together uh, volunteers. And uh, so I'm making sure that our people are represented. So when we sit down and we make those decisions, it's like Shirley Chisholm. I remember reading something about what her quote, and that is obviously we know that either we at the table or we on the menu, but Shirley Chisholm also said, if there's not a chair at the table, if there's not a place to seat at the table, bring a folding chair uh, and be at the table. And I think that's so important that our people are at the table. So I created this focus group so they could be at the table as a voice of the of the of the public of the community to the CRA. It wasn't an official CRA. We weren't that that group was not subject to the Sunshine Law, uh, you know, which means you know one more than one person can communicate on the same board can communicate about the business of that of that board you know, unless it's an open meeting well this was not an appointed group this was just a group that we pulled together in the community a focus group of black folks uh to let the cra know what we wanted well we ended up doing and this was a recent past for the board we ended up doing about 25 homes 25 new homes we really kind of did about 10 or 12 uh, and that spurred the development of other homes and that I think that kind of brought some way around had an economic impact of 2.1 million dollars and if we didn't have this focus group that that was comprised of people from our community black and brown people that probably would not have happened that money would not have been diverted to where it needed to go so that's just a few things on the board that uh, that we worked on uh, in Boston. Thank you Mayor Longworth. Mayor Welch, May Mayor Demings, any comments Bye. for that question? Yeah, I'd say briefly, you know, um, Mayor Hill and Mayor Longworth hit on a lot of points there. And, and what I found um, to kind of level set, you know, President Obama said the greatest threat we face is the undermining of facts and, and data. And I think if we can get folks to a point where we, we agree on a set of facts, it helps us to understand that we have common goals no matter where you are in the city. And so um, just like uh, Mayor Longworth, we had in 2012, when I was on the county commission, a, a impact of poverty report that showed no matter where you are in the county, we were all paying about $2.4 billion because folks had bad outcomes. They were using the emergency room for their primary health care. They were, they were you know, failing school. They were, they were reoffending and going back through the justice system. And we all were paying a price for that. And so when we, when we were able to see that everybody had skin in the game, we were able to pass for the first time, uh, Mayor Longworth in Pinellas County's history, a CRA that wasn't in a downtown because our county policy was the CRAs could only be in downtowns. So they were only in downtown Clearwater, downtown St. Pete, downtown Largo. And you know we said, look, if we're being impacted by poverty to the tune of 2.4 billion, shouldn't we create a CRA that actually addresses poverty uh, in the inner city. And so we created the largest CRA in the county's history in South St. Pete. And that's, that has 25 more years to go. Uh, it's going to generate well over $100 million. And we're funneling that into education and housing uh, and health care and entrepreneurism. So uh, that's how we were able to secure you know, significant funding based on getting everyone to believe in a base set of facts and how we all you know, are in this together. Um, also along the same lines, uh, St. Petersburg just completed a structural racism report that looked at St. Petersburg's history, including Tropicana Field and all of the, the systemic and governmental racism that's impacted St. Pete. We also had a disparity study for our purchasing that came out that showed that we were not utilizing minority vendors. And so we've got all that data to work with. Uh, going forward, and we just hired uh, a purchasing director that, that's going to help us implement it. But we try to get on a on a base set of facts, and then say, "Look, we all have a reason to support this, so we all move forward." Thank you so much, Mayor Well. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, I, I will jump in just real quickly. Um, I, I agree with all of the comments made, but I also found it very uh, interesting when Mayor Hill. Uh, talked about the fact that he has an, an all black uh, council uh, in a community where uh, you know, half or better of the population uh, are black. Uh, but when it came to the procurement 
10 uh, percent, I think, was the number he said was going to uh, a black and minority owned businesses. So the, the simple way, I think, to ensure uh, that uh, there is equity and inclusion is that we have to be intentional about it. We have to make certain that uh, not only are we hiring and promoting for diversity within our respective organizations, uh, but I believe that we have to make certain that we also uh, are providing uh, appropriate training. Uh, many of the organizations sometimes and, um, and small businesses, quite frankly, when we have the opportunity uh, for them to participate in uh, competing uh, for the work that we have, they're not prepared, at least administratively sometimes. So what we have done here is uh, we've recognized that certainly during the, uh, this pandemic, we had uh, hundreds of millions, a uh, billion dollars uh, of federal funding that came into our community that I wanted to ensure that uh, everyone had uh, a, a participation in that. Uh, but when we tried to uh, contract with some of our um, nonprofits that were run by uh, Blacks and Hispanics uh, in our community, uh, that uh, when it came to completing the paperwork, uh, they were uh, not capable of uh, doing all of the paperwork. So we uh, created a program and a partnership with one of the local uh, higher education institutions, uh, Rollins College, to uh, work with them and to prepare them on the administrative requirements of the process so that they could uh, compete for some of the funding. The other thing that uh, I will say to you is that uh, all of us in these roles that we're in, if we do not manage, people will manage what you inspect. Uh, if you don't ask for the data, the reports from time to time about what is the minority participation, uh, things will happen or right uh, beneath your, your eyes sometimes because you, you haven't inspected it. So with my staff, what, what I have done is created these opportunities where they, where they make reports. Uh, in this community, uh, uh, the, the Hispanics represent over a third of our population now. Uh, Blacks are somewhere around 21 to uh, 23 percent, depending upon what numbers you see from uh, the census data. Uh, so when we talk about um, minority inclusion, uh, MWB, DB programs here, uh, I think that we have to do it in a way where others are not threatened by it as well, because sometimes, uh, uh, as uh, Vice Mayor Longworth uh, and, and others mentioned, uh, sometimes they there's a pushback against these types of initiatives. When you say DEI, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, creating these types of programs with people who may not be uh, minorities, what, what they hear there is that they're going to lose something. And so as much as anything, when we teach and train on our diversity, equity, and inclusion, we teach what it is not. We teach what it is, but we also spend some time talking about what it is not. And here in the state of Florida, uh, again, during this legislative session, a legislation was passed that said that a private corporation uh, cannot train and create the time types of uh, perceived division uh, that makes people feel guilty uh, for something, circumstances that they did not create. Uh, but yet they have in many ways benefited uh, from the disparities over the, the hundreds of years at this point. So uh, we, we have an initiative here. Uh, we're beginning with diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, to uh, make certain that we talk about what it is, but what it is not as well, and do it in a manner where people are less threatened by it. Because we are saying that when we are integrated together, we are much stronger as a community when all people have an opportunity to sit at the table uh, and participate uh, than when we do not. So um, those will be my comments uh, similar to what everyone else has said at this point. Thank you so much, um, Mayor Demings. Thank you so much. Um, I'm always one who kind of looks at the time and I, I kind of manage things around. 
I just want to thank everybody once again. This is Q's on the Hill, night number two, Mayor to Mayor. Um, and I want to thank you all for being here. I'm looking at some of the messages that are coming through the chat room, but I'm also looking at some of the questions that I have that are available. And I see some of them having to deal with voting and, and voting, uh, getting people out to vote. And I know that some of the things we talked about had things to deal with getting people out to vote. So one of the questions was leading, leading in the community adds value to Omega. Thus, we salute you as, 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 as mayors. We salute you brothers as mayors. So we wanna to add to the value. So how can we as Omega men better support you in service in your respective county or city and also our respective areas as well? Raise our hands. Uh, yes, well, raise your hand. If, if no one jumped in, I'll jump in there first real quickly. I would be remiss tonight if I didn't talk about uh, representation matters. Now, uh, at all levels of government, uh, my wife is uh, the Honorable Congresswoman Val Butler Demings, who is currently running for the United States Senate, uh, meaning that here within this great state of Florida, she's running statewide. And so I believe that when we talk about all levels of government as it relates to voting, we have to elect people who are going to be sensitive uh, to our issues, regardless of their ethnicity, uh, as long as they're sensitive to our plight, we have to make certain that we're doing what we can. What I say to uh, the brethren, the, the, the fraternal brothers who are joining us here tonight, uh, these political campaigns are expensive. And sometimes in order to get people elected, you got to uh, contribute financially and you have to support uh, these candidates with sweat equity as well. If we want to really impact the laws of the land, we have to be able to elect people at the federal level, the state level, and the local level, uh, individuals who uh, are well capable of being able to make uh, good decisions on our behalf. And so I look forward to this upcoming election season. Uh, I will be, uh, I'm on the ballot, I'm up for re-election. You know, uh, here in our county, we have term limits. Uh, we can, I cannot be, uh, the county mayor more than two consecutive four-year terms and so i'm concluding my first term and i will go into my second term but i have to first get reelected. and uh so uh ironically i didn't have an opponent until uh just a couple of weeks ago and uh, somehow i got two opponents uh my race is a nonpartisan race uh, however you know i was elected uh four times on the ballot as a, as a Democrat when I was sheriff, uh, but I'm in a nonpartisan race. Uh, but because of partisan politics between that which my wife is involved in, that which I have been involved in, uh, somehow uh, the, the opposition uh, fielded a couple of Republicans in my race. And so, uh, you know, we do have to make certain that uh, we do what we can do to raise money, to bring awareness. And so you all are gonna see uh, my wife is traveling to the state. She has, uh, at this point, uh, has a phenomenal team where she uh, has uh, some 400,000 different donors all over the nation. And she likes to say, including North Dakota and South Dakota. Now, uh, we will be visiting your community uh, as well. And so we, we, uh, we just humbly ask that you be aware uh, of the potential, what that means is because uh, as it relates to uh, the con to Congress and to our Senate, uh, representation matters uh, to pick up a Senate seat uh, will be uh, phenomenal for the state of Florida uh, and even uh, pay attention to these uh, statewide races uh, that are upcoming, pay attention to uh, these legislative seats. And even today, you know, the governor, you know, it was announced that the governor is vetoing the congressional maps that have been laid out. Uh, so these are strategies. I think that in some regard, we need to be uh, strategic. And uh, if we want to win, sometimes some of our strategies, you got to keep them close to your chest in order to, to not uh, shoot yourself in the back uh, in the process. But just know that uh, to uh, my fellow uh, elected uh, brothers here and, and uh, support groups, people like 
Russell Drake and others, uh, I do humbly say uh, thank you for bringing this forum together because I think that we do have to have real talk, real dialogue uh, within our fraternity and within our communities if we're going to be successful. Uh, thank you. Yes. Thank you so much, Mayor Demings. Mayor Longworth. Uh, yes, sir. Um, uh, brother Moderator. Um, to Brother Demings, I really, I just want him to know that I appreciate his service to Orlando and uh, for all the number of years that he's been there. And I appreciate the service of his wife, uh, Honorable Congresswoman Demings, and what she's done and how outspoken she is and, and how, she, how she stands up uh, to her conviction. Uh, and I certainly, I support her wholeheartedly uh, and I'm proud to see uh, what she has done and what she's doing. So if you're ever over this way, or if you're ever over this way, uh, Mayor Demon, uh, please, you know, let me know and we can help you, you know, get things organized or at least I can do what I can in Polka uh, to help her. So, uh, you know, please, please, uh, please don't hesitate to, to let me know. And the segue, uh, the segue, that segues into uh, the fact that we as Omega brothers need to support each other uh, as it relates to uh, the political arena. Uh, and, and of course, that's if we agree with a person. Uh, and in most cases we do, but if we agree with the person's uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, political uh, philosophy. Uh, so we need to continue, Brother Bush, we need to continue to do these kinds of, have these kind of force, uh, you know, the Omega, the Omega Day on the Hill or whatever you want to call it. Uh, that is so important, and I think that something like this needs to be uh, needs to be before and after the session, uh, before the session, so we can know what to, you know, know what know what's coming for, uh, and of course after the session to see how we did and 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 how the legislators legislators voted. That that is uh, that is so important. Uh, our mega brothers and non omega brothers, though, because I'm sure their audience that the audience is not all omega. So even um, non Omega uh, brothers, sisters, um, be involved. Be involved in the community. Be a part of the board and the committee. Um, you know, uh, so you can have a voice, and then you can help us as elected officials uh, to move our agendas and our initiatives forward. So our initiatives are always uh, transparent, and they're always for everybody, uh, making sure that we don't slight. The minority community, the black, our black and brown community. Uh, we're going to do that. We're going to give attention to our black and brown community, uh, and that is so important. The other thing is attend commission meetings. Uh, you know, particularly when there are hot issues going on, attend commission meetings. Run for office if you have time to run for office. Run, and if you don't have time to run for office, be a part of the campaign locally. Be a part of a brother's campaign or who or whomever. Um, and um, uh, and and brother, Blue, I don't know whether the the state organization has this, but uh, create you know let's create a legislative team, not just on the on the uh, and and that legislative team would would could could, could lead and direct us uh, those who are elected and non elected officials direct us as to what deals to support uh, and why and what deals not to support uh, and why uh, and 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 um, and and let's have some legislative teams to the extent that we're able to do this on the local level. Because all, as they say, all politics is local. That's where it happens. It happens local. I think one of the brothers, one of the panelists said something about uh, uh, when we're the ones that they see. We're the ones that they see in public and, and Walmart. And, uh, but they don't have, they very seldom see the congressperson and the legislators. We very seldom see them. So, you know, so, so, you know, let's make sure that we get involved. And it's important. <clears throat> Mayor Demons mentioned about the, um, Mayor Demons mentioned about Tallahassee and, uh, you know, about voting, importance of voting, and it's so important. Uh, and because, and of course, Mayor Demons also mentioned something that's true. It's partisan, but it, it, it's partisan, but it, it, they, they have us outnumbered. And you talk to the Democrat, you talk to the Democratic state legislator, uh, and you ask them what happened and can we get this vote? And they say, no, when you're talking about 80 or 70 to 20, you, you know, you're not going to win. But that doesn't, that doesn't mean we should not stop advocating. So just continue to advocate, 
do the things, Brother Boo, that the state organizations, Brother State, do the things that we've been doing. Uh, and at some point in time, we're going to rally and we're going to come out ahead. But just continue to advocate and don't give up. Yeah, thank you, Brother Longworth. And I know um, Brother Drake has heard this, who's over our community and civic affairs, and our state representative who will come on at the end. Um, we'll also, you know, talk a little bit more about that as, as well. But uh, thank you so much. Um, I know, uh, Brother Welch, you had your hand up and Brother Blake, you had your hand up. Did he cover some of the things that you wanted to talk about? Yes. He, he did. He did. I'll just I'll be very <clears throat> brief. You know, the timing of the support matters. I just wanted to add that. Uh, you know, Mayor Demings just told us he's running again, and so we need to be supporting him now. Uh, I don't know if you can share your website, but you know, I want to support you now. Um, and Brother Harry Harvey, who I saw in the chat and was my mentor, was one of the early folks, one of the early Ada Road uh, brothers who, who supported me. But um, there's a tendency to wait, <laughs> wait and see what the polls say, wait and see what the community says. Uh, we need your help early. Uh, rather than later. And I, I would just say that matters. And once we're in office, you know, uh, stay active. Uh, um, if you can't attend a meeting, at least you can do something on social media just to get the word out and build that uh, grassroots support for an issue. That's very important as well. And if you can reach out to the D9 as well to bring them in, it really makes a difference. The folks that do weigh in on an issue have a disproportionate impact because so many folks, that 20% that was mentioned earlier, aren't going to be involved at all. So everyone that weighs in has a has a heavy impact on the issue. Just wanted to add that. Thank you so much. Mayor Hill. I definitely want to echo the sentiments that we've had thus far, but I, I think it's it's critical for us to be present. Um, if we look back at what Cues on the Hill was um, early on, I, I guess about a hundred pounds ago for me, um, watching the bros come to Tallahassee and be there and be present. Uh, when you have brothers like Senator Tony Hill and Gary Siplin who were there. Um, and the fact that once you see an organized group of African-American males come together and, and crowd Tallahassee, it gets attention from everyone. And I think there has to be a presence for us in Tallahassee again in order for things to get done. When we look at Project Manhood, for example, as a program, uh, which is critical to how we deal with young men um, from a leadership standpoint, but also from a prevention standpoint, there are resources that are available throughout the state for many of the programs that we have within our various chapters. Um, there are opportunities that exist there. The other thing is we have to be vocal. And that means that we have to have our voice heard, but that voice has to be unified when we do it. And I think that's a critical piece to everything that we have going on. And the last part of it is we've got to have more of these sessions, not just once a year, but throughout the year, because we have to be informed. And the only way we're gonna truly be informed is to continue to have a network of brothers um, who are both in elected office and those who are working within various communities aside from us coming together on a regular basis to make sure that the critical issues are being addressed on a regular basis. And I, I think it's, and I think it's one of the things I talked to Russell Drake earlier today. And one of the most important things that we can do uh, is prior to session, making sure that we have meetings set up so that we can continually inform brothers as we move forward, as the legislation is being created and drafted. And many times when the, when the amendments are put in place that we're present in Tallahassee, whether it's by platoon or we do it through cycles to make sure that there's always a presence of Omega men um, during the sessions. And that we also make sure on the local levels that we're there to be supportive. You know, in, in, my, own, um, in my own city, I had, uh, a sheriff who was once a, a Democrat for a couple of days before he had a runoff and he was elected, come back in as a, as a Republican and, and demand my resignation uh, inside of my commission meeting, you know, under the, under the same rhetoric that we get under partisan politics about um, defunding the police. But the reality of it is they were mad because we were, we were addressing issues within the black community and how citizens didn't need to be um, held under siege as we begin to do certain things and that citizens needed to be engaged. And so um, those are common tactics that we're seeing all across the country as it relates particularly to African-American elected officials um, coming up for re-election or even being identified for other opportunities. And I think if we as a fraternity continue to be present, continue to be supportive, even on the local level, because the local level is the closest to the people that we can make a true difference and we can start to have an impact on what takes place. Thank you so much, Mayor Hill. 
um, at this particular time, um, and, I, and when I heard all of the brothers, they said, what they're saying to us brothers is we need to get out there, get involved. I saw the fact, um, somebody put in the fact that there are a lot of people who get um, absentee ballots, but they don't go out there and vote. We gotta go out there and we gotta continue to educate. And we just don't educate, you know, a month before the election, we have to educate all year long. So some of the things that we've heard today, it's fine that we've heard it, but if we keep that information to ourselves, then it doesn't, it doesn't help others. So we need to go back to our communities and some of these brothers will be willing to talk to us about that. If you have a mayor in your area or, or city commissioners in your area, and you heard some of these things that, that they were uh, speaking about today, these brothers who were mayors were speaking about today, then you need to ask them about some of those things, the home rule and some of these things that you've heard today and have them explain it in your area to your community, to our community, so that they have an understanding and they understand the impact of that information. May, uh, Brother Mayors, uh, um, as we talk mayor to mayor and we're coming to the conclusion of this, I'm gonna give you one minute to have a closing remarks. I know one minute is hard, but you know we have a, 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 a tight deadline as far as this is concerned. So I'm going to go in and, and, and let you have one minute to say what you need to say. And I really appreciate you all for being here today. So we're going to go ahead and start with Orange County Mayor uh, Jerry Den Demings, Mayor Demings. I'll be real quick. In the words of a former uh, AME bishop by the name of Carolyn Gidry, she once said, pray first, aim high, and stay focused. <laughs> Amen. Thank you, Mayor Demings. Mayor Terrell Hill. Again, brothers, it's an, it's an awesome time to come together uh, for us to be able to provide information and really the fellowship, I think more than anything. But, um, you know, we, we're just at a point where I think it's, it's incumbent upon all of us to continually unite, um, to continually fight for our communities to be engaged and to continue to be informed. And so I'm, I'm excited about what prospects come from this meeting, um, the resurgence of Jews on the Hill, and we're just looking forward to continually moving our community forward and lifting. Thank you so much, Mayor Hill. Mayor Welch from St. Petersburg. Thank you, uh, brothers. I want to thank y'all for this uh, experience tonight for the fellowship and just wanted to uh, remind us of the purpose that we all share and uh, the time that we're living in is providential. And so we have a great work to do together. I'm looking forward to working with y'all and thanks for having us here tonight. Thank you. Mayor Blake from Cocoa, Florida. Thank you, sir. Dr. Boyd, kudos to you, sir, you and Brother Drake. To whom much is given, much is required. There's power in numbers. And I'm a strong believer as the demographics of the United States quickly changes, so do we. We must change our principles and, and, and education in order to adapt. So I salute you. And somewhere in the good book, it tells me this. Those that are first shall be last, and those that are last shall be first. So, gentlemen, choose your number one in my heart. Mayor Demings, we love you and support you to all the brothers. God bless. Amen. Thank you so much, Mayor Blake. And Mayor Longworth, Vice Mayor of Bartow, Florida, in Polk County. Bartow, Bartow, Florida. I think. I thank you. Uh, thank you all for this opportunity, and uh, I, I, I've learned some things. I've, I've, I've picked up some pointers on, uh, so we even learn in these forums, not just those who are listening, but those who are on the panel. We learn. So thank you so much. Keep up the good work. Let's continue. Don't don't stop. Let's continue, uh, and we'll be stronger. Thank you, and appreciate it. God bless. Thank you so much, uh, Brother Mayors. And this is Q's on the Hill, night number two, Mayor to Mayor. We heard some real strong information. You know what to do in your communities. I think that's extremely important to go back into our communities, speak to our mayors. You also know that a lot of these uh, brothers on here are running again. Or if they're not running again, you know, um, they need they will need your support in all, uh, all types of ways. So make sure you look them up. We'll make sure we get information out about them and we need to make sure we, we're supporting them. In addition to that, we know there are not a number of different elections that are gonna be taking place in our community and across the state. We know midterms are coming up. We don't need to wait until August. We don't need to wait until September. We don't need to wait until October. We need to do it now. We need to start now. We're motivated now. We need to create a legislative agenda as you've all heard. We need to make sure we have that before the uh, upcoming session. 
And after the session, we need to talk about it. And I know Brother, uh, Brother Drake and I have had this conversation. And so I'm very, very excited about that. But now I'm going to step back and I'm going to let the final remarks come from our state representative, Brother Darren Tolson, and our um, state uh, community and civic affairs chair, Brother Russell Drake. Uh, as always, thank you, Brother Bowie. Excellent job. Um, and I want to thank all the brothers on the panel tonight for um, tonight's discussion. Again, um, just as last night, I knew um, this one would be a very informative and impactful conversation. But as many of you have echoed on um, the conversation that the conversations that were held tonight can't stop here. Uh, we need to continue to lean on you brothers to to you know know how we can help you further, how we can help our communities further and be as impactful as we want to um, as the discussions led uh, to us tonight. This concept of cues on the hill is not just about um, us making an impact in our communities. It's about all the divine nine organizations and their days of the capital making impacts on the computer in the community. So again, you know, wherever um, we can be of assistance, please don't hesitate to reach out to us as a state organization. Um, and again, thank you, Brother Bowie, for putting on this and, and serving as the moderator tonight and Brother Drake. As always, again, thank you for your excellent work and working with the panelists and, and making this happen. And I look forward to tomorrow night. Thank you, Brother Drake. Uh, thank you for your leadership, Brother State Representative. Um, if people out there just at your homes, give a round of applause to our moderator, uh, Dr. Michael V. Bowie. Um, I think this was a wonderful panel. We have uh, brothers who have been leading in their communities for decades to get to that mayor position and they continue to give back to their uh, communities, families, and the fraternity. And um, the, as the state rep said, we are gonna be taking action. Uh, we're taking notes, we're gonna apply this. So nothing done here is in vain. And um, if you're out there and go to our social media page, Florida Cues, hit the share button on this because this is live feeded and it will be wonderful um, if we could continue to share this to as many brothers and people as possible. The more they view it, um, I think I heard you say, Mary Blake, the people will come. The people will come. And we know it's Omega. So Omega draws all to us. We are the last man, as you know. Um, again, I want to thank you to the panel. Uh, thank you, Brother State Rep. Thank you to the moderators. And tune in tomorrow, because tomorrow is night three. Uh, economics is the key. Uh, we talked about legislation. We had our executives and a mayor to mayor. But we know. Oh, it all comes down to economics much of the time. We have a wonderful panel for tomorrow at the same time. Um, God bless you and thank you for the opportunity.